Welcome to Really Old Movies. I'm your host, Harrison Scullin, and today we'll be talking about my first uh, first in this series, the director, Victor Fem Fleming. My goodness, I'm off to a good start today. <laughs> I'll be talking about director Victor Fleming in five films I've picked from his filmography, and this is the first in this director series. And this isn't per se top five of all time. This is more of uh, five movies I picked from his filmography, some I've already seen before, others I've never seen or even heard of. And this is just my ranking in order of the ones I picked. And so, but before we get started, uh, just some heads up. So I'll be doing these once a month, the Saturday, uh, third Saturday of the month at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So just back to one live stream a month on this channel. Um, I'm just getting super busy with school and work and whatnot. And so I can only do this once a month on this channel. But then also I'm doing another show with my buddy Evan, Pop Culture 33, on his channel. And we talk about Disney movies and we'll be reviewing every single Disney film within their filmography. And so, yeah, just... Bring a heads up with that. Sorry for any confusion or anything like that. Uh, from now on, I'll just be doing one of these once a month on the third Saturday. And we'll be doing I'll be doing the director series for the rest of the year. So yeah, just wanted to get that out of the way. And thank you all so much for voting and for your patience. So going forward, this will be the show. And so let's go ahead and get started. Let me share. So this is Victor Fleming. He was a director in the old Hollywood era. And I have some, you know, behind the scenes details about him from his life. And granted, a lot of the information I have is from Wikipedia. I did not have a book or anything like that to base this off of. So at some point, I'd like to read more about it. And I recommend checking that out as well. But this is just basic information you could read about him on his personal Wikipedia page. So Victor Fleming, he was born on February 23rd, 1889, and he died January 6, 1949. So uh, from what I understand from reading his uh, bio, Victor Fleming was kind of a, I would say, a, a more everyman director, a more journeyman director, rather, where if there was a director who, for some reason, it wasn't working out or anything like that, he would be hired to do the job. And he worked for MGM for most of his career. And uh, many of the films he did there are considered to be classics today. And a lot of which are owned by Warner Brothers now, which is why you'll see a lot of movies that, even though made by MGM, they talk about a lot of Warner Brothers. All right. And so some more uh, basic details about him. He served in the U.S. Army during World War I. He was a photojournalist. And he was also the chief photographer for President Woodrow Wilson while in Versailles, France which I think is really interesting uh, considering, you know, he's a director and he started out working as a photographer. So you can kind of tell he has an eye for photography when he watches movies. And beginning in 1918, Fleming taught and headed Columbia University School of Military Cinematography, and he trained over 700 soldiers to cut, edit, shoot, develop, store, and ship film. And some of the filmmakers that were in his class were Joseph von Sternberg, Ernest M. Schodesk, and Lewis Milestone. He also showed a mechanical aptitude early in life. While working as a car mechanic, he met director Alan Dwan, who he took on as a camera assistant. He soon rose to the rank of cinematographer, working both with Dwan and D.W. Griffith, and directed his first film in 1919. And so, yeah, uh, like I said, with him, he's a very much a journeyman, very much a technical director, and one he really understood the science and the importance of filmmaking, and he took it pretty seriously. He, he didn't see it as kind of a cheap hobby or anything like that. So continuing on, many of his silent films were action movies, often starring Douglas Fairbanks, or he would make westerns. Uh, because of his robust attitude and love of outdoor sports, he's also been known as a man's director. However, he also proved to be an effective director of women. Under his direction, Vivian Lee won Best Actress, Hattie McDaniel won Best Supporting Actress, and Olivia de Havilland was nominated. So each of these, if I remember right, are for uh, Gone with the Wind, one of his most popular films. 
And so, in the opinion of veteran cinematographer Archie Stout, of all the directors he worked with, Fleming was the most knowledgeable when it came to camera angles and appropriate lenses. He was remembered by Van Johnson as being a masterful director, but a tough man to work for. And so, that's kind of the general sense you get from learning about Victor Fleming is he was kind of a, a tough guy, you know, hard to work with, but he got the job done. He was very, very articulate not articulate, but very accurate and very precise with his filmmaking. So now let's talk about his time at MGM. That's the major studio he was most, most known for working with. So in 1932, Fleming joined MGM and directed some of the studio's most prestigious films, including but not limited to Red Dust, starring uh, Clark Abel, Bombshell, and Reckless, all of which showcase Gene Harlow and some of them, uh, like I mentioned, Clark Gable. He also helped with Treasure Island from 1934, starring Wallace Beery, and Captain's Courageous with Spencer Pr Tracy brought a nice touch of literacy distinction, literary distinction to boys' own adventure stories. His two most famous films came out in the year 1939 with The Wizard of Oz and also The Gone, Gone with the Wind. Some other films he made with MGM, also with Spencer Tracy, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde from 1941, which was not received as well as the 1931 film directed by Ruben Mamoulian. And that one starred uh, Frederick March. Fleming also made a 1942 version of John Steinbeck's Tortilla Flat starring Spencer Tracy, John Garfield, Hedy Lamar, and Frank Morgan. Other films Flem Fleming made with Tracy, also with Captain Courageous. And with Captain's Courageous, Spencer Tracy actually won his first Oscar. He also made A Guy Named Joe and Test Pilot. And throughout his entire career, Victor Fleming directed Clark Gable, his most prolific actor, in five different films from Red Dust, The White Sister, Test Pilot, Gone with the Wind, and Adventure. So yeah, that's basically the life of Victor Fleming. You know, uh, the, the Wikipedia page is pretty limited to what his life was really like and uh, just his career in general. Like I said, he was very much a, uh, very much a, oh, what's the word I used earlier? A journeyman director. You know, he was not an auteur like say John Ford or Jean-Luc Goddard or any of those guys. He was definitely a hardworking American, you know, very tough guy. Um, and like I said, he got the job done. So, now I'll get into his filmography. And like I said, these are not my five favorite films by him because I've only seen five films by him. The point of this is to look at the filmography of a director and pick movies maybe you have heard of or haven't heard of and try to review them and see if they're worth checking out. Because some of them, like Victor Fleming, you never hear about, right? You only hear about, well, Gone with the Wind and Wizard of Oz. Those are films everybody knows. But there's some others... I think within this list that I think are worth checking out. So without further ado, let's get into my number five, which is Joan of Arc from 1948. So let me pull up the banner for that. You can pull it up. So let's get into Joan of Arc from 1948. So this film stars Ingrid Bergman, and this is one of the last movies Victor Fleming actually made before he died in 1949. So kind of a short synopsis. This film covers the life of the real French hero, Joan of Arc, and from her starting out, you know, with her call from God to lead the people and help pick a new king of France, to also her various victories as commander of some of the French armies, to her capture and death by the hands of the Englishmen and the Burgundians. And so it pretty much just follows beat for beat of what we know about the life of Joan of Arc. It doesn't really stray too far from it, but we know so little about it that many of the directors who make these movies, they have to kind of put their own spin on it. So earlier this month, I actually reviewed uh, the other version of this movie from 1928 starring uh, Maria Falconetti. And that movie is just about the trial aspect of Joan of Arc's life. This movie covers the entire life of Joan of Arc. So that's kind of the difference there. And so what are my thoughts overall? I give it a four out of five. I thought it was a great movie. Uh, I loved Ingrid Bergman. She's incredible in the role of Joan of Arc. A very commanding, but also uh, very angelic at the same time, right? I thought she was perfect in the role. 
show she shows Joan's warrior side, but also her kind of empathetic side. Because there's a scene I'm thinking of where uh, Joan is feeling very you know distraught because uh, this battle that she just helped the the French get into, a lot of men died, and she felt empathy both for the British and for the French for the death of each of those men. You know, she was totally distraught, and I love that. Um, it, it, it was a great film overall. I got a comment here. This is my watch list. Haven't watched it yet. Well, you know what, Evan? I really recommend checking it out. It's it's a great movie, especially if you watch it after watching the 20s version. It's, like I was saying, the 20s version is just a Jones trial, but this movie covers her whole life. So I think it's a really interesting look at, at the full life of Joan of Arc. Let's see. Anything else I want to man mention? You know, love or hate Joan of Arc, you can't really deny the impact she had on France. You know, the beginning of the movie, they kind of show uh, it's inside of a church and they're naming Joan as a, a saint in the, the Catholic religion. And I thought that was really interesting and really, really cool showing, you know, despite how horrible and tragic her life was, that there's something good that came of it. And so overall for Victor Fleming, I thought he did a fantastic job as a director. The only real critiques I have, and the reason why I don't give this a five out of five, is I wish we saw more of the battles because they really jump through time really quickly in this movie. They don't they don't show enough, and it's hard to tell uh, when that happens because at some points they're talking about this battle, but now we're seeing afterwards without actually seeing it. So they go through time really really quick in it, and I don't know if I like that or not. I, I wish we could have seen more of Joan leading the people, being a warrior and all that. I, I think that would have been really cool. Now, that being said, the movie is two hours and 25 minutes. So it already is long already. I can understand why they, if they did have scenes that they cut them out. But I just wish we saw more of that. A good chunk of the movie was her in jail, which again, that's that's really the most of what we know about her life. But um. I don't know. And, and another critique, you don't really get a sense of time because Ingrid Bergman looks exactly the same. Even at the very beginning when she's supposed to be, I want to say like 17 or 18, she looks exactly the same as she does later in the movie. There's no real aging going on, if that makes sense. Um, with the exception, you know, at the end, she she has her hair cut when she's put on the stake, but that's really it. That's really the only difference. And so overall, I, I thought it was a great movie and uh You'll see as we go along kind of a theme going on where Victor Fleming, he likes to include some uh, Christian, I guess, not theology, but Christian messaging within his movies that I think are great. All right. So now we'll move on to my number four, which is A Guy Named Joe. So this is a movie starring Spencer Tracy and... Uh, I'll give kind of a short plot synopsis of this one. So a reckless World War II pilot, Pete Sandage, played by uh, Spencer Tracy, he dies in battle and he's sent back as a guardian angel to help train new pilots to become as good as he is. While doing so, one of the pilots he's helping falls in love with his fiance, who is still grieving Peter's death. And so if you guys have seen the movie Always by Spencer, not Spencer, by Steven Spielberg, uh, always is a remake of this movie. And so um, what I love about this movie, I thought it was a great story. I was really intrigued by the premise because at first, you know, I was really angry. You know, why would they kill Pete off in the first five minutes of the movie, right? It's like, why would they do that? He's a great character. They had a great romance. It's really tragic when it happens. But, you know, I... I kind of like that they did that because it kind of subverts your expectations. And it also kind of helps you empathize with a lot of people in World War II were experiencing this. You know, this movie came out in the middle of it, right? Um, how many people, you know, had a husband or a father who, who died, you know, just tragically, right? So I think a lot of people really resonated with this movie and really connected with it. And I, I did as well. The only critiques I have... I also gave this one a four out of five. I still thought it was a great movie, but I do think there were some really long stretched out parts that I think could have been shortened, especially after Pete's die after Pete dies, you know, cause the movie was pretty quick up until that point, And then it really slows down and, and it kind of changes tones a little bit. I don't know. It was still good. 
I still really liked it, but I kind of liked before where Pete was kind of snarky and all that. He kind of loses that uh, before the end of the movie. And I guess that's because he's becoming a nicer person. I don't know, but I liked him before he died, I guess. <laughs> um, let's see, some standouts though. Spencer Tracy, he's incredible. And Irene Dunn, who I also talked about in Awful Truth for a couple weeks ago. She was fantastic in that. And she's fantastic in this as well. They have a great chemistry together. And that just makes the tragedy even more uh, tragic when he dies. So I thought they were great. And like I said, if you've seen Always, uh, that that movie is based off of this one. So yeah, that's a guy named Joe from 1943. I think a great romantic movie. I think a fun one to watch with your loved ones. And uh, yeah, thought it was great overall. Uh, it definitely, like I said, had a lot of uh, Christian symbolism and whatnot. I, I thought that was great too. It really gave a hopeful message in the movie because it is tragic, you know. World War II was a tragic, tragic event. And so it was really nice seeing that kind of uh, happiness coming from it. All right. So now I'll move on to my number three, which is The Wizard of Oz from 1939. So this movie really needs no introduction. I think everybody and their grandmother has seen this movie. It's probably one of, if not the most popular movies of all time. Um. But just a short synopsis, uh, Dorothy, played by Judy Garland, she's staying at her aunt and uncle's house, and that house is swept up in a cyclone, along with her dog Toto, and they end up in the land of Oz. And she inadvertently kills a witch with her home, and in doing so, the Wicked Witch of the West is seeking revenge for the death of the other witch. So Dorothy learns from another witch, the good one Glenda, about the Wizard of Oz, who could grant you any witch you want, and she wants to go home, so she decides to find the wizard. And along her way, she meets a scarecrow, a tin man, and a cowardly lion who also want to visit the wizard to seek help in their issues. So that's basically the plot of the movie. Um, overall, I've been a fan of The Wizard of Oz pretty much most of my life. You know, I, I love this movie. You know, I grew up, I grew up reading the book. I read the comic adaptations. I've been a real big fan of the Wizard of Oz and even versions that people don't like, like the Muppets Wizard of Oz, I've always loved. I always thought that was fun. Uh, you know, I love the music from Wicked. I'm really excited for the movie for that. So I, I've been a fan of Wizard of Oz for most of my life. And I just love this story. It's so interesting. It's so intriguing. You know, I, I think Dorothy is kind of a great like avatar into the world of Oz. You know, we all kind of, I can see ourselves in her. Excuse me. I love the Scarecrow and the Tin Man. I think they're great characters. And the Cowardly Lion as well. They help her with her goal and also with fulfilling their own goals. I also think the Wicked Witch of the West, she's a fantastic villain. Very menacing, very evil. And kind of no redeeming values. Like, or, yeah, no redeeming things about her. But that's all right. I, I think that's fine to have a villain like that. She's very much an anti antagonist to Dorothy's goals, and I, I think it's great. Um, and then a lot, of, a lot of the songs I think are fantastic, like uh, "Somewhere Over the Rainbow." You know, Evan and I have talked a lot. That's one of his favorite songs, um, and then one of my favorites in this movie. Not overall, but just a fun, fun song is "Ding Dong, the Witch is Dead." I always love when the Munchkins are singing that. I don't know why it's it's just really funny hearing. These little voices saying, ding dong, the witch is dead. <laughs> um, yeah, no. But overall, it's a great movie. I give it a four and a half out of five. The only thing to me that's really holding it back is, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I don't feel comfortable giving it a five out of five. I don't think it's a perfect movie, but it's definitely worth watching um, at least one or two times. I definitely think a lot of the characters like the Munchkins can get a little tiring. You know, we're there in Munchkin land for a long, long time. I, I think that could have been turned down a little bit. So I guess that would be my critique. But other than that, it's a fantastic movie. Everybody needs to see it at least once for the music alone. You know, the music is incredible. All right. So now I'll talk about Victor Fleming in this movie. So Victor Fleming on February 12th, 1939, 
he hastily replaced George Cukor in directing Gone with the Wind. So when that happened the next day, the studio assigned Fleming's friend Keen Vidor to finish directing The Wizard of Oz, mainly their earliest sepia tone Kansas sequences, including Garland singing of Over the Rainbow and the Tornado and that sort of thing. And although the film was a hit on its release, Vidor chose not to take credit for his contribution until Fleming died in 1949. So, so that's how Fleming was able to direct both this and Gone with the Wind within the same year. So, yeah. <laughs> um, now, when you learn that and think about that, it kind of makes sense. When you watch the, the sequences that are in color, they do differ from the black and white, but I think that works in its favor because, you know, the black and white world is supposed to be different from the colored world in Wizard of Oz. So it's interesting learning that it's actually two different directors and that makes sense. They do feel different in tone and scope and all that. But uh, yeah, I just think that's interesting. I think Fleming really knocked it out of the park with this movie. Uh, yeah, it, it's great. If you haven't seen it again, check it out. It's incredible. Um, the visuals really age well, especially the color. I really love the sequence where Dorothy's in sepia tone, black and white, opens the door and Oz is in color and she steps out and now she's in color as well. I think that's a beautiful piece of movie magic right there. And, uh, it definitely reminiscent of like a Disney movie, like a Disney animated movie, rather very, very magical incredible special effects yeah it, it's a great movie if you haven't seen it check it out all right so now we'll move on to my number two which is captain's courageous from 1937 so this one is kind of the dark horse in this grouping so i had never heard of this movie before i watched it uh i never really knew about it when coming up with this list this movie was on that list i was like okay maybe i'll add that and i'll check it out and I saw it on HBO Max. I was like, hey, this looks great. Watched it, and I was blown away by it. It was incredible. It really was. It was amazing. And it's a simple, put-together movie. So I'll get into the synopsis. So a young rich boy, he's thrown off of a boat with his father, his rich father. And he's rescued by a fishing boat. who are fishing in the harbor there, getting halibut, I think it is. And they teach him harsh life lessons and the value of hard work. And on the way, he learns all of this first begrudgingly, but eventually he learns to love it and learns to love this lifestyle, and he kind of changes. This is definitely a coming-of-age storyline. This has been done a million times, especially nowadays. But to me, I thought it was an incredible and amazing movie, and I gave it a 5 out of 5. And I love the character development of Henry. He's a little boy. And his connection with Manuel, who's played by Spencer Tracy here, and I also love the message of hard labor and being honorable. I think anyone and everyone can benefit in this movie. And this is another example of Victor Fleming's uh, Christian messaging. You know, in this, uh, Manuel, he's constantly praying to God and whatnot. And I really liked that. I really liked his connection. And he tries to teach the boy important life lessons of, you know, being honest with your labor and whatnot. In one scene in particular, so... Uh, members of the crew are having a competition to see who could catch the biggest fish. And while they're doing so, one of the competing boats or one of the competing uh, crew members, his line's all tied up. He can't catch a fish and all of that. Whereas Manuel and Henry, they're able to catch a really big fish. And then Manuel learns that Henry actually sabotaged and tied up their lines. So rather than keep the fish, Manuel throws it back in the water and he says, you didn't earn this fish. You need to do it the right way. I just love that moment. Like I said, very simple, but it's very effective storytelling. And I loved it. I thought it was incredible. I thought uh, Spencer Tracy was great. I even thought the little boy was great. Even if he was a little putz at the beginning, he slowly becomes a good character. And uh, he wants to be, he wants this lifestyle. You know, I, I love that. I, I thought it was great overall messaging, great storyline. And I think a lot of people could benefit from this. It's a great, great story. Very simply done. There's maybe two or three set pieces, the major one being the big boat in the middle of the water. Uh, but just the story, just the characters and all that is what really sells it and really brings good messaging to it. And that's why I loved it. That's why I give it a five out of five. Uh, it's definitely not up with my number one, and I'll talk about it in a second here. But 
it's again a dark horse. I was not expecting it. I was just like, sure, why not? Let's put this one on. It looks interesting. Yeah, it was great. If I have one critique of this movie, just one, is the title, Captain's Courageous. <laughs> I don't know. There's something wrong with that. It's incorrect English. <laughs> you know, Because uh, it's not a phrase or anything. It's not saying this captain's courageous, right? I don't know. It, maybe that's just the English Nazi in me, but your grammar Nazi rather. I don't know. But still, it's like it bothers me. The, the title of this movie really bothers me. There's no apostrophe. There's no anything like that. But that's a very minor critique. But still, I, I, I'm i bothered by it. <laughs> but other than that, it's a great movie. Highly recommend it. Like I said, it's on HBO Max. Uh, it's got a lot of the actors and actresses that Victor Fleming used a lot. Spencer Tracy. Um, oh, I can't remember. I think it's John Barrymore. He's the captain in this picture here. He's also known for being Mr. Potter. He's great in this movie too. But yeah, check this one out if you haven't seen it. It's incredible. All right, now I'll go on to my number one movie by Victor Fleming, and it's Gone with the Wind. I don't know what else to say that hasn't been said about this movie, but I'll try my best. This is, to me, one of the best movies ever, not just in the 30s, but ever. I, I want to say it's in my top 20, top 10, maybe. I digress. I love this movie. And let me do a short synopsis of it. So this is about the life of Scarlett O'Hara, played by Vivian Lee, from her pre-Civil War living in Tara, Georgia, to life during the Civil War, and then her life after the war. So that that's a very small, small synopsis of it, because I really want people to watch it to enjoy it first. I don't want to spoil it or anything, but it, it's it's been spoiled. So I, I guess I won't worry too much about that, but I, I digress. This is one of my favorite movies ever. I love the cast, especially Clark Gable as Rhett Butler and Vivian Lee as Scarlett O'Hara. It's interesting, you know, we like to connect with Scarlett, especially in the scenes where she says she'll never hunger again after the, uh, the horrendous war, the Civil War, right? She'll never hunger again. She'll make sure her family is taken care of. Uh, but again, her character is also terrible, right? <laughs> she's very selfish. She thinks she's, you know, going to save her family. Only she can do it, right? She's very stubborn. She's unwilling to, to let others help her. And uh, it, it's rare to me that you see a film where we see the consequences of one's actions of being super selfish and not letting go of the past. You know, she's very much stuck in the past, very much wanting to help her family. But in doing so, she hurts her family. Uh, she has feelings for, I believe his name's Charles, ever since she was young, before the war. And even after she gets married, she never really loses her feelings for him. And she has a hard time letting go of that, much to the, to the detriment of her, you know. And it's super selfish of her. And no matter the experiences that goes on around her, and no matter how much they affect those that love her, uh, she she just never changes. You know, she's still very stubborn. She's still very, uh, not evil person. Well, I guess you could say she's evil. She's just a terrible, terrible person overall. But yet we're all so connected to her. We all love her character. It's very interesting. And I, I give a lot of credit to Vivian Lee and her abilities as an actress. She definitely deserved that Oscar. I believe she got it for this movie, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, and then Clark Gable as Rhett Butler, he's incredible. He's amazing. He's the he's the only one who really calls her out for what she's doing, for who she really is, and I love that. And he even loves her. You know, he's the only one who sticks around, the only one who's really willing to uh, keep up with her. But even at the end, even he can't handle how cruel and how awful she is and this is going to be a spoiler so if you haven't seen it you know tune out right now but uh their child dies she dies after uh an equestrian accident and even after that scarlet is still selfish it's still all this and Rhett just has had enough of it and that's why he leaves her that's why that very famous scene at the end is you know where Rhett? what should i do frankly my dear i don't give a damn you know like that's the most popular scene in the movie um 
it's because of that. He he just he just doesn't care anymore. <laughs> He's given up on it. Um, it just overall, everyone needs to see this movie. Now, granted, it is four and a half hours long. I will be honest, it is a long movie. Um, to me, the movie really picks up in the second half of the movie after the war and or is that during the war? The, the second half of the movie where uh, they're kind of reconstructing out after the Civil War, I think is the better half of the movie, I'll be honest. The beginning part is super long and drawn out, and but it sets the stage for sure, but it, it's really long. <laughs> so keep that in mind, but I think it's well worth it. Great storytelling, great cast and all that. So now I'll get into some behind the scenes details with Victor Fleming in this. So principal photography for the film began in January of 1939 and ended on July 1st and post-production continued until November of 1939. So director George Cukor, who's the original director for this movie, uh, he had a long relationship with the studio and he was almost in two years of pre-production on the film. He was replaced after less than three weeks of shooting. Uh, I didn't see any reason as to why. Uh, there's some reasons given later, but you know, they, Selznick, who's the producer, and Cukor, they di disagreed over the pace of the filming and the script. A lot of conflict amongst them. But other explanations put it down to Gable's discomfort at working with him. Uh, one of Cukor's biographers claimed that Clark Gable was working in Hollywood's gay circuit as a hustler and that Cukor knew of his past, so Gable used his influence to have him discharged. So that could be another reason, too. There's a a myriad of reasons according to this so vivian lee and olivia de havilland who were both in this movie they learned of cucor's firing on the day the atlanta bazaar scene was filmed and the pair went to selznick office selznick's office in full costume and implored him to change his mind victor fleming who was directing wizard of oz at the time was called in from mgm to complete the film although Cukor continued privately to coach Lee and de Havilland. Another MGM director, Sam Wood, worked for two weeks in May when Fleming temporarily left production due to exhaustion. Can you imagine? I mean, working on this movie and on uh, The Wizard of Oz within the same year, that's just absolutely crazy. And then although some of Cukor's scenes were later reshot, Selznick estimated that three solid reels of, the work, of his work remained in the final cut. So as of the end of principal photography, Cukor had undergone 18 days of filmmaking. Fleming did 93 and Wood 24. So cinematographer, let's see, cinematographer Lee Garms began production, but on May, March 11th, 1939, after a bunch of shooting footage that Selznick and Associates regard as too dark, was replaced with Ernest Holler, working with te Technicolor cinematographer Ray Renahan. Garms completed the first third of the film, mostly everything prior to Melanie having the baby, but not to not receive any credit. So yeah, overall this movie, the production of it was just absolutely crazy. Um, I, you know, kudos to William, to Victor Fleming for being able to, <laughs> to produce both this movie and a wizard of Oz within the same year. Now he wasn't working on them at the same time, but still just the fact he did two major movies within the same year like that, that's just crazy. And ironically, both were nominated for Best Picture, if I'm not mistaken. So he just had a crazy year in 1939. But you know what? It shows. The work that they put into this movie shows. It's amazing. It's incredible. Check it out if you haven't seen it. And that's why it's my number one. That's why I gave it a five out of five. All right. So those are the five movies I picked for Victor Fleming. Again, he's a great director. Um, definitely an underrated director. You know, you never hear about him when brought up in discussions of greatest directors of all time or great classic movie directors. And I think that's just because of the stereotype of the, the journeyman director. And what I mean by that is a lot of people in the industry, they don't, they kind of overlook journeyman directors. They're the directors who show up on time, the ones who finish on time, the ones who put in a lot of work and effort and can transcend genres and can do all of that. They're kind of overlooked. And to me, I think that's a mistake because we have directors like, like Victor Fleming. All five of these movies 
are amazing. They're incredible movies. And I would never have seen them had I not done this series, had I not decided to pick them. Again, three of them were kind of random, just randomly picked. The Well, Joan of Arc was not that random, but still, uh, a guy named Joe, Captain's Courageous, you know, totally random movies I never would have watched had I not done this, and they're fantastic. So I say don't overlook these journeyman directors like Victor Fleming, Michael Curtiz, uh, George Cukor, and all of them are fantastic and great directors I think are worth checking out. But overall, I think, like I said, Victor Fleming, he's got great messaging, great you know Christian men- messaging in them I think is great and I think deeply needed now. You know, messages of hope, messages of redemption, messages of this and that are great and are very much in a lot of these movies and I think are worth checking out. So yeah, those are my thoughts on the films by Victor Fleming, and he's a great director. I highly recommend checking him out, especially the ones I mentioned here. And just as a recap, it's number five, Joan of Arc, gave a four out of five. A guy named Joe, also four out of five. Captain, I'm sorry, Wizard of Oz, four and a half out of five. Captain's Courageous, I gave a five out of five. And Gone with the Wind, I gave a five out of five. So all these movies are available right now on HBO Max, so check them out before they're taken off because I know uh, they don't always keep them all on there. In fact, when I was trying to watch Joan of Arc, initially I had to do it through Roku. That was my original thing, but then I saw it was on HBO Max finally. You just never know when they're going to come and go, right? <laughs> That's the, the deal with streaming. But yeah, check out his work. I look forward to checking out more from him. If, if it's more of this, I'm really looking forward to checking out more of it, especially the ones with Clark Gable. I really like Clark Gable's movies. Um, yeah, and real quick before we close, so I got some cool things here. So I want to say yes. For the 50th anniversary of Wizard of Oz, they released this VHS tape. And it's a little bit bigger because it's got a book inside of it. Kind of shows like the behind the scenes, kind of cool stuff like that. Let's look at this. So yeah, we got like the cowardly lion here. And just some of the set pieces. Really cool stuff here. And uh, like I said, it's a VHS. Pretty cool. And another one that I'm really, really impressed with is this one for Gone with the Wind. This is a deluxe edition. I believe also for the 50th. Let's see here. No, for 199. Okay, so no. But still, this is really cool. Really cool collector's thing. I just found it at my local thrift store for two bucks, if that. It's really cool, the the movies he did. And yeah, I, I got them in my collection. I'm hoping at some point they release, especially Captain's Courageous on a higher quality film. I don't know if they have or not. I'll have to check into that. But yeah, overall, Victor Fleming is a great director. Check him out. And yeah, that's pretty much today's show. Thank you all so much for coming by. And uh, like I said, these will be once a month. And you know what? I'll announce the next director so that you guys can check some out before. So let me pull that up here. But yeah, like I said, these will be once a month on the third Saturday. So the next one is... Drum roll. It's a problem with Letterbox. I made too many lists on here. Fleming and Billy Wilder. So these are the, oh, I don't know if you can really see them there, but the next list will be of Billy Wilder. And I look forward to that one. I just finished watching the last movie for that one. So I'm, I'm really excited. There might be some controversy in that with my favorite pick for that. But yeah, that's everything for today. Thank you all so much for coming. This has been Really Old Movies. I'm your host, Harrison Stillen. Take care. <laughs>